said himself that he would actually not put something down on paper until he knew exactly what he wanted to write, which I think is, is only partly true. I mean, having actually watched him working, I mean, I know that he sometimes didn't know what was happening next. But even in these early sketchbooks, it's right first time, more or less. Aged 23, a grateful Briton paid tribute to his mentor. He wrote a set of variations on a theme by Frank Bridge. It revealed a startling and original voice. Frank Bridge variations are, in a sense, the end of the apprenticeship. They're a homage to Frank Bridge, and the individual movements have titles. It's dedicated to F.B. himself, his integrity, his energy, his charm, which, which reflect the individual movements. It's a homage, but it's also a moving on. This is my last piece under your tutelage. This is my thank you to you. Now I'm going to be my own composer. In 1935, the young Briton found work at the GPO film unit. The shift is finished. He provided music for a series of groundbreaking documentaries, including Coalface. We should remind ourselves that some of the earliest manifestations of music concrete, of using musical instruments to reproduce sounds from the mechanical or natural universe, these were developed for the first time by Britain and a tiny number of musicians within the area of documentary film. The cold face is a mile from the shaft. The maverick poet W. H. Auden was responsible for the poetry on the coal face. It was an important collaboration for Britain, who shared Auden's left-wing political and pacifist views. One has to think of the wealth of knowledge uh, that Auden commanded. He was, uh, as it were, an, an education to which Britain enjoyed 
unparalleled access. And on the other hand, Britain himself was enormously taken by the poetry to which he was extraordinarily sensitive. I mean, he, he, he had a, a tremendous feeling for words, as we know. And uh, Auden, with words, was a master conjurer. And was that kind of mm, fiery, but wonderfully controlled inspiration and creativity that obviously would have made the most enormous appeal um, to Britain. Look, stranger, at this island now. A living light for your delight discovers. Stand stable here and silent here. That through the channels of the eerie wonder light will river. The swaying sound of the sea. Auden was in turn delighted, saying, one had always been told that English was an impossible language to set or sing. Here at last was a composer who set the language without undue distortion. And it's to ledge is opposed the pluck and knock of the tide. And the shingle scrambles up to the sucking surf. And the gun lodges a moment on each side. He obviously started off partly under Auden's sort of jurisdiction, and Auden himself was a remarkable anthologist, quite apart from being a wonderful poet, and Auden influenced, I think, obviously some part of Britain's taste, but you can tell from those very early things that Britain set long before he, he met Auden, that he obviously had a very personal and extremely wide feeling for poetry in general. In fact, I believe it is his feeling for poetry which actually governs pretty well the whole course of his musical direction. I was very much influenced by Auden, not only in poetry, but in, in life too. He went to America, I think it was late 38, early 39, and I went soon after and felt that I would make my future there. Many of us young people at that time felt that Europe was more or less finished. There was this great Nazi fascist cloud about to break at any moment, and one felt that Europe didn't have the will to resist. He arrived in America, as he later said, muddled, fed up, and looking for work. His traveling companion was a singer, Peter Pears. Well, I was really going as his esquire, I think, in a way. I was perfectly aware of his stature and how great he was. I mean, there's no doubt about that. I was copying out the score of various things. And in fact, Auden had got part of a, an old house filled with sympathetic friends, uh, including for one time Gypsy Rose Lee. But in fact, the atmosphere was really too bohemian and we didn't stay there very long. Britain was not only discovering himself and his music and the scope and the ability and, uh, and uh, and the capacity that he had as a composer, but he was also discovering his uh, relationship to uh, Peter, Peter Pears. And in America, finally, they did become lovers. And from that day onwards, Ben's life was never the same. And there's that marvelous chorus, you know, in Paul Bunyan, once in a while, uh, the odd thing happens. Once in a while, the moon turns blue. And I remember Ben sitting there and saying, well, of course, uh, Donald, uh, that was Peter. <laughs> <laughs> 